Welcome back to the second installment of a reading from Mr. McIntosh on prayer and the prayer meeting as given in the McIntosh treasury. This is a second installment of four parts that he wrote. The former uh, piece we wrote, we read the first two parts of prayer and the prayer meeting. And now we're going to read the next two parts of the same prayer in the prayer meeting by Mr. C.H. McIntosh. And you can grab those first two parts in the other episode. And we get down to part number three. Part number three, where it is called the essential conditions of effectual prayer. If we return to Matthew 21 and 22, we find another of the essential conditions of effectual prayer. Quote, in all things whatsoever ye shall ask of prayer, in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. This is truly a marvelous statement. It opens the very treasury of heaven to faith. There is absolutely no limit. Our blessed Lord assures us that we will receive whatsoever we ask in simple faith. The Apostle James, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, gives us a similar assurance in reference to the matter of asking for wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. What that gives to all liberally and abrades not, and it shall be given him. But here's the moral condition. Let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall obtain anything of the Lord. From both of these passages, we learn that if our prayers are to have an answer, they must be prayers of faith. It is one thing to utter words in the form of a prayer, and another thing altogether to pray in simple faith, in the full, clear, and unsettled and settled assurance that we shall have what we are asking for. It is greatly to be feared that many of our so-called prayers never go beyond the ceiling of the room, in order to reach the throne of God, they must be born on the wings of faith and proceed from hearts united and minds agreed in holy purpose to wait on our God for the things that we really require. Now the question is, are not all not our prayers and prayer means sadly deficient on this point? Is not the deficiency manifest from the fact that we see so little result from our prayers? Ought we not to examine ourselves as as to how far we really understand these two conditions of prayer, namely, in anatomy and confidence? If it be true, and it is true, for Christ has said it, that two persons agreed to ask in faith can whatsoever they ask, why do we not see more abundant answers to our prayers? Must not the fault be in us? Are we not deficient in concord and in confidence? Our Lord, in Matthew 18, 19, comes down, as we say, to the very smallest plurality, the smallest congregation, even to two. But of course, the promise applies to dozens, scores, and hundreds. The grand point is to be thoroughly agreed and fully persuaded that we shall get what we are asking for. This would give a different tone and character altogether to our reunions for prayer. It would make them very much more real than our ordinary prayer meeting, which, alas, alas, is often poor, cold, dead, objectless, uh, objectless and desultory, exhibiting anything but cordial agreement and unwavering faith. How vastly different it would be if our prayer means were the result of a cordial agreement on the part of two or more believing souls to come together and wait upon God for a certain thing and to persevere in prayer until they receive an answer. How little we see of this. We attend the prayer meeting from week to week, the very right we should, but ought 
not, we not to be exercised before God as to how far we are agreed in reference to the object or objects which we are to be belayed before the throne? The answer to this question links itself on to another of the moral conditions of prayer. Let us turn to Luke 11. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, let me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give as him as many as he needs. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened. These words are the very highest possible importance, insomuch as they contain part of our Lord's reply to the request of his disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. Let us not one let not one imagine for a moment that we would dare to ask to take it upon ourselves to teach people how to pray. God forbid. Nothing is further from our thoughts. We are merely seeking to bring the souls of our readers into direct contact with the word of God, the veritable sayings of our blessed Lord and Master, so that in the light of those sayings, they may judge from themselves as to how far our prayers and our prayer meetings can come up to the divine standard. What then do we learn from Luke 11? What are the moral conditions which it sets before us? In the first place, it teaches us to be definite in our prayers. Friend, lend me three. Lend me three loaves. There is a positive need felt and expressed. There is one thing before the mind and on the heart, and to this one thing he confines himself. It is not a long, rambling, desultory statement about all sorts of things. It is distinct, direct, and pointed. I want three loaves. I cannot do without them. I must have them. I am shut up. The case is urgent. The time of night. All the circumstances give definiteness and earnestness to the appeal. He cannot wander from one point. Friend, lend me three loaves. No doubt it seems a very untoward time to come. Midnight. Everything he looks discouraging. The friend has retired for the night. The door is shut. His children are with him in bed. He cannot rise. All this is very depressing, but still the definite need is pressed. He must have the three loaves. Now, we cannot but judge that there is a great practical lesson here which may be applied with immense profit to our prayers and our prayer means. Must we not admit that our reunions for prayer suffer sadly from long, rambling, desultory prayers? Do we not frequently give utterance to a whole host of things of which we do not really feel the need and which we have no notion of waiting for at all? Should we not sometimes be taken very much aback were the Lord to appear to us at the close of our prayer means and ask us, what do you really want me to give or to do? We feel the most thoroughly persuaded that all this demands our serious consideration. We believe it would impart great earnestness, freshness, glow, depth, reality, and the power of our prayer means were we to attend with something definite on our hearts as to which we can invite the fellowship of our brethren. Some of us seem to think it is necessary to make one long prayer about all sorts of things, Many of them very right and very good, no doubt, but the mind gets bewildered by the multiplicity of subjects. How much better to bring some one subject before the throne, earnestly urge it, and pause so that the Holy Spirit may lead out others in like manner, either for the same thing or something equally definite. Long prayers are often wearisome. Indeed, in many cases, they are a positive infliction. It will perhaps be said that we must not prescribe any time to the Holy Spirit. True indeed. Away from us be the thought. Who would venture upon such a piece of daring blasphemy? We are simply comparing what we find in Scripture, where the brief pointedness is characteristic. See Matthew 6, John 17, Acts 4, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, etc., 
with what we too often, not always, thank God, find in our prayer meetings. Let it then be distinctly borne in mind that long prayers are not the rule of Scripture. They are referred to in Mark 12, 40 in terms of withering disapproval. Brief, fervent, pointed prayers impart great freshness and interest to the prayer meeting. But on the other hand, as a general rule, long and desultory prayers exert a most depressing influence upon all. But there is another thing very important in moral conditions set forth in our Lord's teaching in Luke 11, and that is importunity. He tells us that the man succeeds in gaining his object simply by his importunate earnestness. He is not to be put off. He must get the three loaves. Importunity prevails even upon even where the claims of friendship prove inoperative. The man is bent on his object. He has no alternative. There is a demand and he has nothing to meet it. Quote, I have nothing to set before my traveling friend. In short, he will not take a refusal. Now the question is, how far do we understand the great lesson? It is not, blessed be God, that he will ever answer us from within. He will never say to us, trouble me not. I cannot arise and give thee. He is ever our true and ready friend, a cheerful, liberal, and upbraiding giver. All praise to his holy name. Still, he encourages importunity. And we need to ponder his teaching. There is a sad lack of it in our prayer meetings. Indeed, it will be found that in proportion to the lack of definiteness is the lack of importunity. The two go very much together. Where the thing sought is as definite as the three loaves, there will generally be the importunate asking for it, and the firm purpose to get it. The simple fact is, we are too vague. And as a consequence, too indifferent in our prayers and our prayer meetings, we do not seem like people asking for what they want and waiting for what they ask. This is what destroys our prayer meetings, rendering them pithless, pointless, powerless, turning them into teaching or talking meetings rather than deep-toned, earnest prayer meetings. We feel convinced that the whole church of God needs to be thoroughly aroused in reference to this great question. And this conviction it is which compels us to offer these hints and suggestions with which we are not yet done. So here's part four of four parts. The more deeply we ponder the subject which has been for some time engaged in our attention, the more we consider the state of the entire church of God, the more convinced that we are of the urgent need of a thorough awakening everywhere in reference to the question of prayer. We cannot, nor do we desire to, shut out our eyes to the fact that deadness, coldness, and bareness seem, as a rule, to characterize our prayer meetings. No doubt we may find here and there a pleasing exception, but generally speaking, we do not believe that any sober spiritual person will call in question the truth of what we state, namely that the tone of our prayer means is prayerfully low and that it absolutely imperative upon us to inquire seriously as to the cause. In the papers already put forth on this great, all-important, and deeply practical subject, we have ventured to offer to our readers a few hints and suggestions. We have briefly glanced at our lack of confidence, our failure in cordial unanimity, the absence of definiteness and importunity. We have referred in plain terms, and we must speak plainly if we are to speak at all. Too many things which are felt by all, the true spiritual among us, to be not only trying and painful, but thoroughly subversive to the real power and blessing of our reunions for prayer. We have spoken of the long, tiresome, desultory preaching prayers, which in some cases have become so perfectly intolerable that the Lord's dear people are scared away from the prayer means altogether. They feel that they are only wearied, grieved, and irritated. Instead of being refreshed, comforted, and strengthened, and hence, they deem it better to stay away. They judge it to be more profitable if they have an hour to spare to spend in the privacy of their closet, where they can pour out their hearts to God in earnest prayer and supplication, than to attend a so-called prayer meeting where they are absolutely wearied out with incessant, powerless, hymn singing, or, or long preaching prayers. Now we more than question the rightness of such a course. We seriously doubt if this would be all the way to remedy the evils of which we complain. Indeed, we are thoroughly persuaded it is not. It, if it be right to come together for prayer and supplication, 
And who will question the rightness? Then surely it is not right for to anyone to stay away merely because of the feebleness, failure, even the folly of some who take part of the meeting. If all the really spiritual members were to stay away on such a ground, what would become of the prayer meeting? We have very little idea how much is involved in the elements which compose a meeting. Even though we may not take part audibly in the action, if, it were, if we are there in a the right spirit, there really to wait upon the God, upon God, we marvelously help the tone of the meeting. Besides, we must remember that we have something more to do in attending to me than to think of our own comfort, profit, and blessing. We must think of the Lord's glory. We must seek to do his blessed will and try to promote the good of others in every possible way. And th- neither of these ends, we must, we may rest assured, can be attained by our deliberately absenting ourselves from the place where prayer is wont to be made. We repeat, and with emphasis, the words deliberately absenting themselves, staying away because we are not profited by what it takes, what takes place there. Many things may crop up to hinder our being present, ill health, domestic duties, lawful claims upon our time if we are the employment of others. All these things have to be taken into account. But we may set it down as a fixed principle that one who designedly, abs- de- designedly absent himself from the prayer means is in a bad state of soul. The healthy, happy, earnest, diligent soul will be sure to be found at the prayer meeting. But all this conducts us naturally and simply to an, another of those moral conditions at which we have been glancing in the series of papers. Let us turn for a moment to the opening lines of Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. And he spake a parable to them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge who feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said with himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will venture, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night to him, though he bear along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Here then, we have pressed upon our attention the important moral condition of perseverance. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. This is intimately connected with the definitiveness and importance opportunity to which we have already referred we want a certain thing we cannot do without it we importunately unitedly believingly and perseveringly wait on our god until he graciously sends an answer and as he most assuredly will if the moral basis and the moral condition be duly maintained but we must preserve persevere but we must persevere We must not faint and give up, though the answer does not come as speedily as we might expect. It may please God to exercise our souls by keeping us in waiting on him for days, months, or even years. The exercise is good. It is morally helpful. It tends to make us real, to bring us down to the roots of things. Look, for example, at Daniel. He was kept for three full weeks waiting on God in profound exercise of soul. Quote, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither flesh came nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three full weeks were fulfilled. All this was good for Daniel. There was a deep blessing in the spiritual exercises through which his beloved and honored servant of God was called to pass during those three weeks. And what is especially worthy of note is that the answer to Daniel's cry had been dispatched from the throne of God at the very beginning of his exercise, as we read at Daniel eight twelve. Then said he to me, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come to thy words. But... How marvelous and mysterious is this? Quote, 
the prince in the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief per- princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. All this is full of interest. Here are the beloved servant of God mourning, chasing himself, and waiting upon God. The angelic messenger was on his way with the answer. The enemy was permitted to hinder, but Daniel continued to wait. He prayed and fainted not, and in due time the answer came. Is there no lesson here for us? Most assuredly there is. We too may have to wait long in the holy attitude of expectancy. And in the spirit of prayer, but we shall find the time waiting most profitable for our souls. Very often our God in his wise and faithful dealing with us seeks, sees fit to withhold the answer simply to prove us at the reality of our prayers. The grand point for us is to have an object laid upon our hearts by the Holy Ghost, an object as to which we can lay the finger of faith upon some distinct promise in the word and to prefer persevere in prayer until we get what we want. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Ephesians 6, 18. All this demands our serious consideration. We are as sadly deficient in perseverance as we are in definitiveness and importunity. Hence, the feebleness of our prayers and the coldness of our prayer means we do not come together with a definite object, and hence we are not impotent, importunate, and we do not persevere. In short, our prayer meetings are often nothing but a dull routine, a cold mechanical service, something to be gone through, a wearisome alternation of hymn and prayer, hymn and prayer, causing the spirit to groan beneath the heavy burden of a mere profitless bodily exercise. We speak painly and strongly. We speak as we feel. We must be permitted to speak without reserve. We call upon the whole church of God far and wide to look at this great question straight in the face, to look to God about it, to judge themselves about it. Do we not feel the lack of power in all of our public reunions? Why those barren seasons at the Lord table? Why the dullness and feebleness in the celebration of that precious feast we ought to stir the very deepest depths of our renewed being? Why the lack of unction, power, and edification in our public readings? The foolish speculations and the silly questions which have been advanced and answered for the last 40 years. Why those varied evils in which we have been indwelling, in which are being mourned over almost everywhere by the truly spiritual? Why the barrenness of our gospel services? Why are souls not smitten down into the word? Why is there so little gathering power? Brethren, beloved in the Lord, let us rouse ourselves to the solemn consideration of those weighty matters. Let us not be satisfied to go on with the present condition of things. We call upon all those who admit the truth of what we have been putting forth in these pages on prayer and the prayer meeting to unite in cordial, earnest, united prayer and supplication. Let us seek to get together according to God and to come as one man and prostrate ourselves before the mercy seat and perseveringly wait upon our God for the revival of his work, the progress of his gospel, the ingathering and upbuilding of his beloved people, let, a, let our prayer meetings be really prayer meetings and not occasions for giving out our favorite hymns and starting our fancy tunes. The prayer meeting ought to be the place of expressed need and expected blessing, the place of expressed weakness and expected power, the place where God's people assemble with one accord, take hold of the very throne of God to get into the very treasury of heaven and draw thence all we want for ourselves, for our households for the whole church of God and for the vineyard of Christ. Here's a poem. Yes, there's a power with which man can wield when mortal aid is vain, that eye, that arm, that love to reach, that listening ear to gain. That power is prayer which soars on high through Jesus to the throne and moves the hand which moves the world to bring deliverance down. Such is the true idea of a prayer meeting. If we are to be taught by Scripture, it may be more fully realized amongst the Lord's people everywhere. 
May the Lord, Holy Spirit stir us all up and press upon our souls the value, importance, and urgent necessity of unanimity, confidence, definitiveness, importunity, and perseverance in all of our prayers and prayer meetings. There is another editor note at the end. It says, it may perhaps be useful to notice that in the foregoing most needful pages, the beloved author has been speaking of the prayer meeting and the moral basis and conditions of prayer in general, not of personal secret prayer. The importance of it can be hardly be overestimated. The lack or neglect of this soon tells in the spiritual life of the Christian. Is not the lack of this explanation of such leanness of soul from which knowledge alone is not able to lift us up? It is as it were, the spiritual gauge of a soul's condition. There in the secret of the closet, the godly soul ever loves to pour out in its father's ears its trials, its fears, its desires, its wants, its thanksgivings, in all their details. And what comfort, what joy, what godly strength and purpose the soul carries from thence, what preparation to go through the daily toil and testings of the day. Beloved of the Lord, let us wait on God that we may know more of this secret power gotten in our closet with him. And that's the reading from Mr. C.H. McIntosh on prayer and the prayer meeting.